And I'm glad to come and see you face to face because, as borrowing a line from Brother King Barrett, I want to get to know these people I'm going to be working with for the next thousand years. <laughs> now, from 1 Corinthians 10 11, uh, we can go to the second slide. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. Now these things happened to them by way of type, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the purposes of the ages are come. Now the two longest types that we have in the Old Testament are Joseph in Egypt, and then the Exodus as a picture of the plan of the ages. They cover close to 10 chapters each. Can you think of any other type that comes anywhere near that long? Well, we might think of the tabernacle, which has a lot of chapters associated with it, but it is several different topics. And similarly, the last nine chapters of Ezekiel, Ezekiel's temple, but again, those are several different pictures. But with Joseph in Egypt, we have a single extended type. And with um, the Exodus, we have an extended type covering approximately almost 10 chapters each. In the first one, we have Joseph in Egypt. Now, we've already heard a bit about uh, his, how he got to Egypt by being sold by his brothers. But we want to talk about the time while he was in Egypt until he brings Egypt back to uh, the apex of its glory. Now, at the beginning, he was sold to uh, the house of Potiphar who was like the head of the secret service, captain of the king's guard or the pharaoh's guard. And that would be under Pharaoh Sesostris III. But also in that time, uh, he was put into prison. Now, he had been uh, starting out low in the house of Potiphar. And then as time went along, he kept getting increased in authority. And now he goes to prison, really humbled. But even in prison, he gets to increase in authority there. And this was no ordinary prison. This was the king's prison. That's where you got to meet people who were in the government and got caught. Can you think of any university he could have gone to to get that kind of an education in government? <laughs> but he did. And to um, not delay matters too long, uh, during that time, he encountered the butler and the baker. Now, evidently, um, the new king at this time, which would be Amenemes III, uh, ate something and got a king-sized belly ache. So he sent his butler and his baker to the prison until he could figure out which one was guilty. And so during that time, the butler and the baker each had a dream. And Joseph interpreted the dream of the bread and the cup. Then after two years, the uh, baker, uh, the butler that uh, was uh, back in his position again, remembered because Pharaoh had had two dreams. And so Joseph was called to interpret them. And then Joseph interpreted the dreams and he was exalted to be number two ruler in all of Egypt, only under Pharaoh himself. Uh, just a, let's see if we don't have too long? Yes. Uh, Pharaoh Amenemes III 
is remarkable among archaeologists uh, re reports that he brought the Middle Kingdom of Egypt up to the height of its glory, but without war to do it. And when we see what happened with the seven years of plenty, followed by the seven years of famine, we can understand why. Now, we, we can at this point say we appreciate what Joseph did. He was willing to be humbled. He's a good example for us. But then I think we can learn a little bit more still. For the time that uh, Joseph was in the house of Potiphar and increasing in authority, that's very much like our Lord Jesus as the Logos. And the more beings that he created with the Father, the more he increased in authority. And so I think we can go on to slide number three. Uh, that would be Joseph in Egypt. I think we've gone just one slide too far. Yes, um, that's the one, yes. So... Joseph in the house of Potiphar pictures for us Jesus as the Logos. But then he is humbled. He is brought down to prison. Now, that's not to say death. Otherwise, he could not have increased in authority, could he? But he accepted the humble position and did the best he could with it and he increased in authority during his first advent here on earth. And during that time, he interpreted for us the symbols of the bread and the cup. This we do in remembrance of him at the memorial with the bread and the cup. But when he is brought up, and he uh, identifies the symbols in Pharaoh's dreams, that of the uh, seven good years, followed by seven very bad years. We think, well, does that really fit the gospel age followed by the millennial kingdom? But the answer is yes, it does. During those first seven years of plenty, the people didn't see their need for Pharaoh. They were getting richer and richer and richer. And this is something the archaeologists tell us early in the reign of this Pharaoh, Amenemes III, that uh, things, the tombs of the nomarchs or regional rulers were getting more and more elaborate. And then suddenly something happens and if there are any tombs for them at all, they are just very skimpy. And this would be the years of the famine. The famine then is the time when the people recognized their need for Pharaoh. And so Joseph managed these seven years of famine in which the people see their need for Pharaoh. And we interpret that when the world will see its need for God in the thousand-year kingdom of Christ. So Joseph became the number two ruler in all of Egypt, just as Jesus resurrected his number two ruler in the entire universe. And that will last forever. The people will sell themselves to the Lord. Now, we get directions from this. That's what we want, is not just the intellectual knowledge of what's going on there, but what can we get out of it? The picture of Joseph in Egypt focuses our attention on Joseph. And what does Joseph symbolize? but our Lord Jesus. 
It is there to focus our attention on our Lord Jesus Christ above all. Now, let's ask ourselves the question, am I becoming worthy of Jesus? Am I willing to be humbled as he was? Am I willing to be faithful as he was? We might just read Philippians 2, verses 6 through 8. Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, counted not the being on an equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a a servant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient, even unto death, yes, the death of the cross. Am I becoming worthy of Jesus? That's a direction that we want to get from Joseph in Egypt. Now we get to the other very long type in our Bibles, and that is the Exodus picture. It is a picture of the plan of the ages. It starts when Moses comes to Egypt. Now, that's after the 40 years in the wilderness. He comes to Egypt, and then a number of things happen. I will just, oh, we seem to have lost our uh, chart of the ages. (laughs) but it starts at the beginning of the gospel age when Jesus comes at his first advent following that there's a period of plagues 10 plagues that covers the gospel age of this present evil world and in the last plague the firstborn of the Israelites are delivered from death As the firstborn, the heirs of Pharaoh's kingdom die. And that will be like at the end of the gospel age, at the end of the gospel age harvest, when the church of the firstborn are delivered from death. And at the same time, the heirs of Satan's kingdom will be destroyed by virtue of having no more kingdom to inherit. Then there follows a seven-day feast of unleavened bread, feast of Passover, if you like to call it that. And we notice with the death of the Egyptian firstborn, now the Egyptians are willing to let the Israelites go. And so they leave, and they have an encampment at Sukkoth, and then at Etham, which is by the edge of the desert, and they were originally called to go three days' journey into the desert. And at that point, the Lord says, turn, and they go to a place, I think it's towards the north, from Ismailia on north, to go where they would have gone if they'd taken the other road out of Egypt. And uh, that lures Pharaoh and what he does. So I think those first three days of the Feast of Passover picture for us the millennial resurrection kingdom. But Pharaoh comes after them again, says uh, the people have lost their way, uh, so let's go after them and bring them back again. So Satan, at the end of the thousand years, is loosed in order to give the world its final exam. And the result of that final exam will be, I think the vast majority will pass. And that would be millions of the Israelites and the mixed multitude that pass over the uh, sea. But when Pharaoh and his hosts try to do it, Satan and those that do go with him will be destroyed once and forever in the second death. But then... That's day number four of the seven-day feast of the Passover. We've got three more to go. 
And remember, they were called to go three days' journey into the wilderness to serve the Lord their God. So those three days that they were called to do from the beginning picture for us those perfect ages of eternity never to end. Okay, somebody may say, how about those uh, ten plagues? Well, yes, there were some uh, distinction between the first three and the last seven. In the first three, they fall on the Egyptians and the Israelites both. But then the Lord says, I will put a division between my people and thy people, Pharaoh, as that there be no more plagues in the land of Goshen where my people dwell. And at that time, Moses takes the dominant role. For the first three, it's, say unto Aaron thy brother, do this. Say unto Aaron thy brother, do that. Say unto Aaron thy brother, do the third thing. And then uh, the Lord puts this division between the peoples. Well, I think we can see what that would mean, that as dominant a role is occupied now by Moses for the last seven plagues, so Christ, at his return, begins the harvest work of separation. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins. That should be our motivation. And that you receive not of her plagues. Um, now, I will not be dogmatic on it, but I will offer my suggestion, at least, that what are the three major world events that occupied the gospel age between our Lord's first advent and his second advent. And I think the first of those would be the fall of the Roman Empire. It resumed, of course, uh, a couple centuries later under the papal rule. The second would be the uh, Reformation. And I think um, most of the authorities of the Catholic Church would agree that there was a plague on them. And the third one, I think, would be the French Revolution. And I'll deviate just here for a moment to mention that uh, the Pope became a civil ruler in a process of two years, 538 AD, when Belisarius, the East Roman general, withdrew from Rome to chase after the Ostrogoths, the Pope was now left as the sole ruler of the city of Rome. And then a year or so later, Belisarius was recalled by the East Roman Emperor, leaving the Pope in charge of all Italy. And by, Lateret says that by the end of the century, Pope Gregory the Great was raising taxes, negotiating with foreign powers, raising armies. He became the chief, um, the dominant political force in the western part of the Roman Empire. And that started in 538 and 9. So now when Christians saw around 1800, what happened in 1798? Well, on February the 20th, the, East Ro the uh, French general, Berthier, drove the Pope out of Rome on February 20th of 1798. And uh, he was driven north, and then he was being driven ultimately towards Paris, and he never got farther than about somewhere around uh, Valence, France, and there he died, 1799. And now our brethren back around the early 1800s noticed something. From 538 and 539 to 1798, 1799 is exactly 1,260 years. And suddenly there was a lot of interest in the chronology, Bible prophecy and chronology at that time. Of course, there, there were some problems in interpreting just what it should be, but they were interested in the 1290, 1335 days. They were interested in the seven times and so forth. And this ignited the interests of Protestants 
not only in the Second Advent movement, but in the Age to Come movement. Both of those got stimulated in the 19th century. Now, they're not the same. Recently, somebody pointed out to me that um, the two were parallel movements, but contrary to one another. The Adventist movement was looking forward to Christ's return to burn up everything on the earth, utterly destroy it. The Age to Come movement was considering that, no, Christ's return was for making this earth a place for the world to be regenerated. So actually, the Bible student movement uh, started really more out of the Age to Come movement, although there were some Adventists who uh, were associated with it. But George Storrs, for example, and George Stetson were both more associated with um, age to come. Well, I hadn't really expected to spend so much time on that, but hopefully that's of some interest. Now, we want to find the direction for our Christian lives in this. Think about Aaron. Moses was not glib tongue. So the Lord told him, okay, you use Aaron to be your spokesman. Has Christ been here on earth during the gospel age telling people what's coming and what things they should do? No, he has left that to his church in development, pictured by Aaron, the priest, the high priest. So am I willing to be Christ's spokesman as best as I am able? Consider Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 3. Read that in a moment. That's Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Everyone, therefore, who shall confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Now, what we understand from the scriptures here this picture that shows us not only the period of the ten plagues and the ruination of Egypt, but also those seven days feast of unleavened bread. The millennial resurrection kingdom is yet to follow. Are we trying to do our best to tell people about that? There are still a few people willing to listen. Am I willing to be Christ's spokesman? And now for the rest, the millennial resurrection kingdom is for the world in general. And after all, if Jesus Christ died once for all, should not all benefit? He died once for all except whom? No exception. Now, if that's the case, that gives us a motivation to learn to have love even for our enemies because our Lord Jesus Christ died for every one of them. And who am I to carry a grudge against someone for whom my Lord Jesus Christ died? And now, not everyone will listen to what you have to say. Maybe only a relative few will do so. So, remember, your life may be the only Bible your neighbor ever reads. Well, now, those are the two longest types that we have in the entire Old Testament. 
If anybody knows of another one, I'd like to hear about it. I, I don't mind being contradicted. But let's go on now to a couple of other things here. Well, actually, let's settle for the tabernacle. Uh, now, the tabernacle didn't last forever. It was superseded by uh, Solomon's temple. And then uh, we have, after that, uh, Ezekiel's temple given to us as a prophecy. Oh, why the difference? Well, uh, just to be a little coarse about it, uh, the tabernacle itself was to show us things mostly for during the gospel age. But when we get all the way to Ezekiel's temple, this is showing us the finished picture for things. Now, we might look at the Day of Atonements. I didn't misspeak there, that Day of Atonements. If one looks at the Hebrew calendar, it will say it's Yom Kippur, which is singular. But every time you find it in the Hebrew Old Testament, it's Yom Kippurim, which is plural. So literally, it is the Day of Atonements, because there are two applications of the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. One at the beginning of the Gospel age to extend for all of the church for a couple thousand years, and then one at the end of the Gospel age for the whole world for the additional thousand years. Now, the focus of the Day of Atonements is on the bullock, and it represents Jesus, as I think everyone would agree. Hard to imagine there isn't anyone who wouldn't agree with that, that the focus of the bullock is on Jesus. But now we have two goats, they come from the people. Now, the bullock does not. The bullock is just there or provided by the priesthood. But the two goats come from the flocks and the herds of the children of Israel. They come from a different origin. And these two goats are there, but there's only one ram for a burnt offering, not two goats and two rams for a burnt offering. That is, only one goat is accepted for sacrifice. Uh, we see this in Leviticus 16, 5. We'll suggest then that the Lord's goat would represent the little flock, the 144,000. We could see this perhaps alluded to in Hebrews 13, 10 to 13. Maybe we'll take a moment to read that. Hebrews 13, 10 to 13. We have an altar, yes, we have an altar either to partake of or to be offered on. And so we see from the context which it is. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat that serve the tabernacle. Well, there was one such altar, and that was the day uh, on the Day of Atonement. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned without the camp. Yes, that was true on the Day of Atonement. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, that's the only source of the atoning merit, suffered without the gate. That's without the gate of uh, Jerusalem. Let us therefore go unto him without the camp. Well, that's the other place where the bodies were taken to be burned uh, in the tabernacle. Go forth unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Now, if you run to talk to somebody um, from uh, Church X, that may be a little difficult for him. Uh, because, uh, well, wait a second, there's only one ransom merit, isn't there? Jesus Christ. So how do we have these two different bloods? Is the ransom shown in the tabernacle? 
Well, a ransom is a corresponding price, a substitute, a substitutionary atonement here. Does a bullock die for another bullock? No. Does a goat die for another goat? No. So the ransom is not shown in the tabernacle. I don't know that we would understand it even if it were. But there is one redeeming merit. That is provided first by the bullock. After the bullock is offered, then the um, incense is brought in and the uh, ascending offering or burnt offering is offered. Not all of that is repeated for the goat. That's because the acceptance is shown in the sacrifice of the bullock, which we would understand is the, ex the one ex thing accepted for atonement is the blood of Jesus Christ. But the blood of Jesus Christ is offered in part first for the church, a couple thousand years later, then for the world in general. And if we got no other thing from the uh, Day of Atonement, that should be that the offering of Jesus Christ's blood is in two stages, first for the church and then for the world. Now, we could also have uh, read some more scriptures. Uh, Obadiah 21, the last verse, where there's um, saviors standing on Mount Zion. Do you normally think of yourself as a savior or even potentially becoming so? But that's what it is saying in the church. The 144,000 in Revelation are standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb. We will join with him. We won't contribute a single drop of merit but we will join with Christ for the offering of his blood on behalf of the whole world of mankind. Also, we have Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, brethren, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice. Three things. A, living sacrifice. We are to present our bodies as a sacrifice. Yes, this is a covenant of sacrifice. But it's not just a sacrifice passive, but it is to be a living sacrifice. We are to be active in what we do to sacrifice for the Lord. And the next thing is that first word, a, a living sacrifice. We are to work together in harmony to present our bodies, a living sacrifice. We well, have just a moment here to talk about uh, the other goat, the one that was rejected for sacrifice. And I would suggest that it has to be a consecrated class because the, both goats were presented before the Lord and therefore that it would be the great multitude. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 through 17, gives us three possible uh, outcomes for those who enter the consecrated way. The first are those who build well on the rock, on the foundation. It's not a case of the building on the rock versus building on the sand, as we have in Matthew 7. They both build on the rock. Those that build well, well, they receive the reward of the high calling, the divine nature. Those that do not build well, <coughs> excuse me one moment, I have to do something about this. Those that don't, it doesn't say they'll be destroyed. It says their works will be destroyed. 
But nevertheless, they shall be saved in spite of it. And of course, then you go to verses 16 and 17 that tell about those who uh, go back and uh, work towards the flesh, give themselves over to the flesh, and uh, that, of course, would be the second death. But here in the tabernacle, we're only interested in the first two groups. But we have a problem. I would not have known how the uh, departure goat, goat of Azazel, scapegoat, some call it, not quite as well translated, how does it make atonement? It's rejected for sin offering, but yet it says that it is to make an atonement. And based on the uh, Leviticus 16, I don't think I could have figured it out. However, the tabernacle becomes the temple, and the sacrifices of the atonement day continue on in the temple and so forth. And then we get to Ezekiel's temple, and finally we have our answer here as to how the departure goat makes atonement. That would be Ezekiel chapter 44, verses 10 through 15. And it finally explains the mystery, or that to me it was a mystery. Now we have a distinction between the Levites and the faithful priests in this chapter. So we're talking first about the Levites. The Levites that went far from me when Israel went astray, that went astray after me after their idols, they shall bear their iniquity. Oh, that's the same language we have back in Leviticus 16. They shall bear their iniquity. Yet, you know, we, we would say, if they caused Israel to worship idols, the Lord would surely cut them off. But no. Yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary, having oversight at the gates of the house and ministering in the house. They shall slay the burnt offering. Doesn't say they get to offer it. And the sacrifice for the people. And they shall stand before them to minister unto them because they ministered unto them before their idols and became a stumbling block of iniquity unto the house of Israel. Therefore have I lifted up my hand against them, saith the Lord Jehovah, and they shall bear their iniquity, and they shall not come near unto me to execute the office of a priest unto me, nor to come near to any of my holy things unto the things that are most holy. But they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have committed. Yet... I will make them keepers of the charge of the house for all the service thereof and all that shall be done therein. Now, what does this mean to us? How do we teach the people? You know, we should be saying, if you want to join anything, you must join Christ to be saved. Now, should we say you must join our denomination or our fellowship to be saved? Whether it's Roman Catholic, Watchtower, Dawn, PBI, Divine Plan Foundation, My Ecclesia? Or you must follow Martin Luther, John Calvin, William Miller or Joseph Wolfe, Pastor Russell, Brother Woodworth, Brother Pollock, Brother Hagensick, the elders of such and such an ecclesia. Again, it is God and Christ that we must join. Now, does that mean that everybody who uh, is in that list should not be uh, considered, we should be able to appreciate 
what our other brethren have done for us in time past and even time present. But we should not worship them. We should call to attention, what does the Lord say in his word? I don't find it surprising if I have the same scriptures that another brother, Brother Russell or Brother Pollock or whoever it is, that we find the same harmony in those scriptures with the same thought. But it should be because it is from the word of God and nothing less. So, what if I make a mistake? Who won't make some? After all, it says he, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. John 16, 13. So how should I treat those who differ? Well, the old Adventist movement uh, had a lot of different thoughts and the unfortunate thing is that most of them were accusing the others that didn't agree with them. Should we do the same? It was a little better in the age to come movement. Now, we're all affected by our environment, but we should not be products of our environment. So, in our Christian walk, let us take our lesson from the tabernacle also and let us cast our lot for the Lord's scope.